What you just heard from Trace is a remarkable new development in what we are learning about the Wuhan coronavirus. 15% of everybody in New York State may have already contracted that illness and not known they had it. That's not close to the result that we expected, and it's not the only study to find stunningly widespread infection of this virus. There are many such studies, and they come from around the world. This new evidence means that the virus is far less deadly, a full order of magnitude less deadly than authorities first told us that it was. At the same time, the same research also suggests that the virus is incredibly easy to spread between adults, which is another way of saying the coronavirus is nearly impossible to control. How do we know that? Because we haven't managed to control it. Our national mass quarantine hasn't worked in the way they told us it would. But you never know that from listening to the people in charge. Given the suffering and the disruption these policies have caused, you'd think the people who made them and now are, are enforcing them would be staying up late every night double-checking their assumptions against reality. But they're not doing that. They're doing just the opposite. They're ignoring the science because the science indicts their political judgments. A recent analysis published in the Wall Street Journal found virtually no correlation at all between how quickly a state locked down and how deadly that state's coronavirus outbreak turned out to be. You'd think that would be breaking news on every channel. Needless to say, it's not. It's essentially being ignored. From Australia, meanwhile, we have new evidence that for huge segments of the population, this virus poses no meaningful risk, and that's not an overstatement based on these numbers. Researchers in Australia tracked 18 students and staff who contracted the virus across 15 different schools. They concluded that about 850 people had come into close physical contact with the people who carried the virus. Yet they found only two cases of secondary coronavirus infections at those schools. None of them involved students infecting adults. What does this mean? It suggests that this strain of coronavirus is extremely mild in children, and all the other numbers bear that out. It's very hard for kids to get this illness. It's hard for them to spread it. If they do get it, and some do, the risk of dying is mathematically close to zero. Now keep in mind, and this is an essential contrast, this virus behaves in a way that's dramatically different from ordinary influenza. Children contract and spread the annual flu very easily. If you have them, you know it. By the numbers, the annual flu is much more dangerous to children than the coronavirus is. Now, why is this relevant right now? Well, it's relevant because we've shut down education nationwide. Many schools and colleges are now considering staying closed in the fall. For the kids who go to those schools and their families, this is a disaster. So it's fair to ask, who has been saved by doing this? And the people in charge don't even bother to tell us. Shut up and lock down, they say. You you're saving lives when you do. People will die if you don't. Every day you hear that. But it's not science. Those are political slogans. Increasingly, people fluent in the actual science of epidemiology are asking hard questions about these policies. Here's a physician and researcher from California called Dr. Dan Erickson. Erickson and a partner just delivered a 50-minute briefing on the latest numbers from California. The video they made has been viewed millions of times in a few days online. The bottom line is, after looking carefully at the data, these two researchers have concluded that California should end its shelter-in-place order. Watch. We've seen 1,227 deaths in the state of California with a possible uh, incidence or prevalence of 4.7 million. That means you have a 0.03 chance of dying from COVID-19 in the state of California. 0.03 chance of dying from COVID in the state of California. Is that, does that necessitate sheltering in place? Does that necessitate shutting down medical systems? Does that necessitate people being out of work? These are serious people who've done this for a living for decades. They have in their hands the largest currently available data sets on this question. And the question they're asking after analyzing all of those numbers, are the lockdowns worth it? So what is the answer to that? What's so striking is that so many politicians, the ones enforcing the lockdowns, don't seem at all interested in asking it. Instead, they're bullying forward as if nothing has changed. Just today, the San Francisco Bay Area announced it'll be extending its lockdown until the end of May. That's five weeks from now. What is the scientific justification for doing that? They didn't tell us because there is none, none. 
You may remember what they first told us back in February and March. They said, we have to take radical steps in order to, quote, flatten the curve. Well, six weeks later, we're happy to say that curve has been flattened, but it's likely not because of the lockdowns. The virus just isn't nearly as deadly as we thought it was. All of us, including on this show, everybody thought it was. But it turned out not to be. Hospitals never collapsed. Outside of a tiny number of places, they never came close to collapsing, at least not from an influx of infected patients. Instead, something remarkable happened, something amazing, really without parallel in American history. The opposite happened. Thanks to the lockdowns, hospitals have begun to collapse. Why? From a lack of patients. Politicians who couldn't pass ninth grade biology decided that practicing physicians should not be allowed to calculate the risk of transmitting the virus. They're just not qualified, unlike us. So these politicians banned so-called non-essential procedures, many of which are in fact essential. The results of this policy? In many hospitals, entire floors have been mothballed. Doctors and nurses are being furloughed in the middle of a pandemic. This is insanity. It weakens our health care system. Its effects will last for many years. That's all from the lockdown. So how long will we have to live with these lockdowns? Earlier this month, Dr. Anthony Fauci, whom we are apparently required by law to respect no matter what he says, suggested that, in fact, we may never be allowed to resume normal life. If back to normal means acting like there never was a coronavirus problem, I don't think that's going to happen until we do have a situation where you can completely protect the population. If you want to get to pre-coronavirus, you know, that might not ever happen in the sense of the, the fact that the threat is there. And we should tell you that is the same Dr. Fauci, and keep this to yourself because, as noted, it's not allowed to show any skepticism whatsoever. But that's the same Dr. Fauci who also announced that shaking hands, the ancient custom of shaking hands, should be done away with forever. And then a week later told Snapchat that actually it's fine to have sex with strangers you meet on Tinder. That was his epidemiological advice. Other experts on television warned that full-blown lockdowns may be necessary until a vaccine or effective treatments are found. What they didn't mention is that scientists have never produced a single approved vaccine or antiviral drug for any coronavirus. So that could be a while. And that thought seemed to please frequent television guest Zeke Emanuel. Realistically, COVID-19 will be here for the next 18 months or more. We will not be able to return to normalcy until we find a vaccine or effective medications. Is all that economic pain worth trying to stop COVID-19? The truth is, we have no choice. Oh, the truth is we have no choice. Well, here's a handy guide for you in case you watch a lot of television. When a political operative like Zeke Emanuel, someone with a long history of lying, begins a sentence with the phrase, the truth is you should probably be on guard. When he ends that sentence with, we have no choice, you should be terrified. And in fact, that's wrong. We have always had a choice. Other countries made different choices from ours, in fact. They're not waiting for a vaccine to open their societies. Why would they do that? There's no precedent for doing that as a scientific matter. For example, we spent millions of dollars and more than a decade trying to find a vaccine for the SARS virus. Scientists never developed one. That's a shame. But did we halt life in the United States in response? We didn't. In fact, you may not even remember that any of that happened. The striking thing is the science has not changed that much since then. Unfortunately, American politics have changed a lot. And that's the difference. Dr. Scott Atlas is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. We're happy to have him on tonight. Doctor, thanks for coming on. So let me just, leaving the political questions aside, bottom line it, given what we are learning about how easy it is to spread this virus between adults and about its actual death rate, what kind of response seems scientifically justifiable now? Yes, and that, that's really the key question is how to move forward. Well, it's actually good news that the virus spreads widely and without high risk uh, to the vast majority of people. It's in fact, half the people are totally asymptomatic. Now, why is that good news? That's good news because that means that we have a better chance of developing population immunity. 
instead of total lockdown going on which prevents that we have a chance to have people develop their own antibodies and eventually have enough people have these antibodies to block this sort of network of progression and contagion to the people who are vulnerable. That's exactly the same reason why we give widespread vaccines to induce the so-called herd immunity. And by the way, that's exactly the same thinking about why it might be useful to take serum from people with antibodies who've had the virus and use it as a treatment or prevention to those who are vulnerable to the virus. We don't know for sure that antibodies that are produced are effective in giving immunity, but we expect it. It's consistent with decades of virology and immunology literature, and actually it would be unexpected if that didn't happen. So the idea that the nation needs to remain frozen in place until a vaccine is developed, uh, ass assess that recommendation, if you would. Well, I, I think it's not just counterproductive that I, as I just mentioned, it's actually harmful. It's harmful because we know, as you alluded to, massive health care that is critical has been uh, skipped, avoided. About half of people with cancer who get chemotherapy have skipped their treatments. Roughly 80% of the brain surgery cases have been canceled. We're talking about people who have not only skipped critical care for acute stroke and acute heart attack, but in addition, all the biopsies for unsuspected and now, un now undiscovered tumors have not occurred. We're talking thousands per week of those. And what's more so and even ironic is that people are skipping their children's vaccines. We are not only people have died and are dying, but we are creating a massive problem by not opening up health care with this single minded policy of COVID-19 at all costs. And of course, the second part of it is we know how to protect the vulnerable here. It's not uh, uh, so simple, but we know who the vulnerable population is. And we yes. know that as we go and let people mingle, like happened in the epicenter in New York, which is sort of, this goes back to what you said, over 20% of people in Manhattan were discovered to have antibodies. And that, that's a good number. It would have even been higher if we would have had more social mingling, but we know that young people, young healthier people, I don't see the logic in having keeping them isolated. Yes. They're a vehicle to keep uh, the transmission going to other lower risk groups and have population immunity develop. That seems, for some reason, it is suddenly verboten to say any of that out loud. I'm glad that you did. Obviously, you have an informed perspective on this. Dr. Atlas, thank you very much for coming on. Today. Okay, thanks for having me. Michael Flynn was briefly the National Security Advisor of the United States, and then his life was completely destroyed. He was the first person in Washington sucked into the corrosive Russia hoax. Now his attorneys say new evidence, which is turned